Hello, a very good afternoon to everyone. Okay, welcome to the talk for Framing Works of Art at the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. It's my great pleasure today to introduce you, Hugh Phipps. Hugh received his undergraduate degree from Cornell and a Master of Fine Arts in Painting from the University of Michigan. He has studied and worked in paper preservation for almost four decades. First as a commercial framer in Washington, D.C., and then for 35 years in the Conservation Division of the National Gallery of Art. While at the gallery, he worked on improving hinging and matting of art on paper and developed hinge-free support systems and silk enclosure packages. He has given preservation workshops for many prestigious institutions, including the Smithsonian, the American Institute of Conservation, and the Professional Picture Framers Association. He has also given workshops for conservation programs at the Winter Tour and the Buffalo State University, and the ENP in Paris, as well as a number of museums and libraries, including the Louvre, the Hermitage, the British Library, the Getty, the Metropolitan and MoMA in New York, and the Library of Congress. Since retiring from the gallery, he has continued developing and testing housing designs while teaching and writing for Picture Framing magazine. He has also served as a consultant to TrueView, a division of Vericon, and assists Crescent Cardboard Corporation. Let us put our hands together to welcome Hugh Peace. Um, <clears throat> I can't tell you how honored I am to be here um, in <clears throat> to share with you one of my favorite things, which is the collections of the National Gallery of Art in a city that is one of my favorite places, <clears throat> and in Southeast Asia, which is one of my favorite parts of the world. Um, and especially because this year represents 50 years for Singapore, and I remember I was in high school and was so delighted to see the birth of this wonderful city-state. Uh, I love the idea of city-states. You know, Florence, Athens, they're great. And I think Singapore is bringing this tradition back to life with great honor. So what I'm going to do for you today is to share what I used to, what I've been doing, what I did before I left Washington. I would invite friends from Delaware, where I live, to come down with me and have lunch and to walk through the galleries and find out the really good stuff. So that's what we're going to look at today. And then we'll look at some of my technical blah, blah later. And I apologize, some of you may have seen some of these slides before. But to begin with, and make sure I can navigate things here. Well, I'm probably holding it backwards. Yeah, please. OK, thank you, with a little help. Um, what, I, what, I'm try, what I would like to share with you is a vision of the, the word framing because it's a word that has a lot of different aspects and it means, of course, in one sense, surrounding something with a contextual element, but it also can mean protecting something. And I, the, the, our, our walk through the gallery will comprise both of these functions. So the frame itself owes a great deal to architecture. If you look at picture frames, you will see that they all come from building motifs. And the great framers in history um, were all great architects, whether it's Stanford White or uh, Carla Murata, the, they understand the order and the grammar of ornament, and they can bring it to us with the classical uh, precision that a, a, a good Beaux-Arts architect does. So what I suggest is when we look at a picture, and this comes from my philosophy training, we're looking into a world we're not in. We're looking into another world. And we need something to limb or transfer us from this reality to that, and that's the role of the frame. Because it, it recognizes the history and the, uh, the taste of the world that we're not in, and it somehow brings that beyond the, beyond the perimeter of the picture into our world. So the two things are married successfully. 
And if we were in Washington, um, we would begin in Gallery 1. One of the wonderful things about the National Gallery, and I do hope you all get to go, because it's a wonderful place to visit, and I have to say, I have seen another wonderful National Gallery, which is the National Gallery here, uh, which I was delighted to, I mean, it's just a splendid, splendid thing. And I, I have every complete confidence that it is going to grow as the gallery in Washington has. Even if you start late, it doesn't mean you can't take an honored place in the family of uh, institutions around the world. Because our, our gallery started in 1941 in the uh, sort of run-up to World War II and was a kind of efflorescence of patriotism on the, on the uh, part of a bunch of great uh, donor families. Um, so I think here I've already seen uh, the, the makings of the same kind of thing and I look forward to seeing Singapore as a major player in the cultural uh, world of, of, of uh, major museums. So starting in Gallery 1, um, as the, as the West Building or the Old Building does, we have a wonderful example by Bernardo Dotti. And this is the Virgin and the Christ Child, but it's also, we see uh, a number of things here, which is why I've always liked with my Smithsonian class and everyone else to start here. Because we see a real frame, the gilt outside, which is Gothic, with certain parts of uh, certain classical ornaments like the dentils going over the top, but we also see the Virgin enthroned in a represented frame. So we have the, the two worlds brought together, everything here at once. Um, we also have the fact that when we are looking at the represented world, we have to accept conventions that would be just insane in, in our, this, if you look at this picture, it's quite surreal. Look at the size of the Holy Family and everyone around them. They're completely out of scale, and it doesn't occur to us to raise that issue. But um, it's, it, it, what happens, this is what's called an engaged frame. So it means that the whole panel was commissioned as a thing unto itself, and then the artist created the uh, artwork, and then it was gilded, and then all the punching was done. So you, you, when you usually see the budgets for this kind of thing in this early uh, time in art history, the, the gilder, the carver, and the artist were all paid pretty much the same. Later, it, it, very quickly, it, it um, separates out. But <clears throat> the, the wonderful frame on the Agnolo Gatti here um, is one that I love to tell people about because I can tell you who made what. Um, so, I'm, if, can you hear me if I stand up here and yell? Because I, I have to speak with, <laughs> with my arms. But these wonderful columns were carved by someone in Pennsylvania, and the capitals were carved by my colleague uh, Steve Wilcox. Um, and when they make these things, they tend, the bugs tend to favor the parts that stick out. So. Uh, um, the original columns and the original capitals were eaten, eaten by wood-boring insects decades, hundreds of years ago, perhaps, so they had to make new ones. And um, whereas everything else, of course, it goes back to the uh, proper uh, century and, and is, is, it's, it's in quite good shape other than these additions. But I, I've watched over the years as the columns and the capitals came and went. Sometimes they would like them there, and then sometimes they take them away. I think by now they're settled in and they're going to stay. But um, you could never, you could go to Washington and see them with those not there. So um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, th th what we're looking at is all engaged frames. This is the uh, Master of St. Veronica, um, and I don't know what I left out down there. I'm sorry about that. But um, it, it, it is a northern version of an engaged frame. So you see the frame is quite minimal, but it is actually carved into the panel. It's all, all to the one. So at this point, you are looking at whole artistic entities. Everything is together. Um, we don't have, the frame is not separable or, or uh, se ever separated from its subject. Here, however, we have another story. So this uh, wonderful uh, virgin and, and child by Giotto um, was in another frame when it arrived at the gallery. And um, 
they decided that it, the frame was probably a Victorian uh, you know, sort of copy of what they thought was a good uh, Giotto period frame. But the, the, uh, my colleagues realized that this was not visually appropriate. So they searched the world to find the best example they could of what kind of frame a Giotto should be in and they settled on the, a frame in the Kunsthistorisches Musee in Vienna. And so they had a wonderful frame maker named Willi Schmulke in Vienna copy that frame, and he did. He did a wonderful job of copying it down to the fact that the outer elements on the, that are actually um, right through here, this was just stained wood because that's exactly what was true of the Viennese frame. So my colleague Steve Wilcox had to then gild the parts. We didn't, we didn't want this to look like it, was, it came out and uh, was sort of an incomplete uh, item. So he gilded the outside. He then did a beautiful job of toning it to match the uh, tone of the Giotto panel and then did beautiful punch work. Uh, using uh, what I would call a kind of fine Italian hand, which is don't make it too regular, make it flow, make it lyrical. And, and Steve is, is basically everything I'm going to be saying to you this afternoon, 90% of it comes from him. You'll see him shortly in, a, in his lab working. But um, the, uh, when, you, when you go to the gallery, you will, there's a lot to learn from the labors, labels. And if you're walking through the gallery, anything that says director's tour, stop, because it's all the best of the best. Well, this is not only on the director's tour, but it's a star on the director's tour. But if you look at the labeling of it, um, you will see that I have put Fra Lippo Lippi over on the left and Fra Angelico on the right. The reason is that down here, this portion, is Fra Angelica. And you should stop and stay with that because it's as good as anything that you'll see in Washington and probably pretty, pretty much anywhere else. Behind it, there's a crowd scene that's occupied by kind of cartoon characters, which is Fra Lippo Lippi. And then on top of the uh, stable, there's some birds that were painted by the Medici family painter because they owned it. So it's like a collector's stamp, um, having the peacocks and the pheasant up there. So what, if you look at the labeling, you, will, the, you also see when you see this, there are smaller, what are called perdella paintings uh, that came from the bottom part of an altarpiece. And of course, the Fra Angelico perdella painting is on the right. The Fra Lippo Lippi is on the left. So they recognize that we should be able to read all these things, but it's, it's not immediately evident when, you're, when you visit. <coughs> Frames are not always on paintings. This is a, uh, a Renaissance jewel called Morse with the Trinity from Lille, France. And I don't know who Morse is, um, but uh, it's, it's uh, a picture of some religious uh, moment. And the part of the wreath and the pearls and the uh, Renaissance part, the rest is a later edition. Um, this is a great example of how um, we're always worried when we're working on works on paper with relative humidity, but because this is enameled uh, gold, this also, when it traveled back to Lille, France, from whence it had come, uh, it had to have a specially built container and frame to maintain the proper relative humidity because enameled uh, objects are actually quite RH sensitive. So it, it too has, has very interesting, not only uh, 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 sort of iconographic uh, aspects, but also physical aspects, at least to me. So um, one of the, the things that I used to love to share with visitors, and this is uh, a tribute to our wonderful, wonderful donor, Lessing Rosenwald of, of Pennsylvania. Um, he collected incredible prints including this box from 1500 from France called Christ with the Man of Sorrows. And it's, it's a wonderful illustration of the fact that that print has been sitting inside that box for 500 years and it looks fine. 
Okay, so what I'm going to tell you, this is my example of why side grain wood is nothing to be terrified of, because this has survived that long and it's in that great a shape. Um, in fact, we have very few 15th century prints, and a, a lot of them, a large fraction, are what they're called paste prints that come off box lids, um, like this one. This happens to be the only one in the gallery that is a full box still remaining. But um, <clears throat> the most important painting in the National Gallery is Ginevra da Benci. So, um, it, it, its frame is uh, a, a wonderful uh, period piece of molding that is definitely not original to Ginevra. Um, we know that because she was much longer before she actually had hands. And they've, they have been trying to find out which Leonardo drawing might have been the drawing of her hands. Um, but <clears throat> if you see this, you have to walk around the back side and you will see a wreath there that, that has the family motto and, and sort of iconographic elements in her story. She was a young lady who had a, a, apparently a not very happy marriage, um, but it is a riveting, riveting example. It's, uh, it's right up there with the Mona Lisa and La Gioconda, uh, <clears throat> I think, in, and the Lady with the Ermine among Leonardo's greatest portrait works. Um, but not only do we have Leonardo's painting, we also have Leonardo's fingerprint. So the yellow dot above shows the whorls of his fingerprint that is in the, the paint surface. And um, if we get to a point in the future where we know what that looks like, we may know more about Leonardo's makeup as a human being. But um, this was discovered as they were doing uh, work on the painting in the not too distant past. Um, Another painting that I am particularly fond of, and I have called this Workshop of Verrocchia because that's the old label. Um, it is now given to uh, Nerocchio de la, uh, no, um, uh, um, uh, de, uh, Crady, the uh, uh, Lorenzo de Crady. Um, and I feel that the old label used to say Workshop of Verrocchio, possibly Leonardo. I agree with that because one of the great privileges I had in my time at the gallery was to handle a lot of drawings that belonged to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, they own, the Royal Library owns over 400 Leonardo drawings and the, they were just amazingly generous in lending them out in the last century. And in that whole time, uh, I, I, I developed a certain sense of what Leonardo's touch and line look like. And I remember uh, asking a colleague, is this possibly Leonardo? And she said, yeah, the label says it. Well, it, it didn't. Um, then they changed it back and then they gave it to Crady later. So I'm, I'm still telling you, it's only about this big, but go spend time with it. It's fantastically beautiful painting and the, the light on the Virgin's face and her hair are to me just, uh, if they're not Leonardo, Someone else did a really good job. Um, this is not such a good painting, but it's a great thing to look at. So this is a, a, a portrait of a lady by Nerocchio de Landi, and it is a Renaissance painting in a Renaissance frame. That you almost never see, because the bugs ate most of the frames. But a very, very bright colleague from the Met, now at Yale, Larry Cantor, um, came down and realized this is actually probably the door to a cabinet. Because when you look at the proportions of the frame, it doesn't read like a frame. It doesn't have the architectonic uh, sort of intervals and episodes that you would find in a frame. But again, if you, it, it's the only, it's one of two frames that uh, are at the National Gallery that are in the great uh, reference book, uh, the book of the picture frame by Klaus Grimm. And it gets a whole page. Um, and it, it's, what I love about it is when I go and look at it, I am looking at the Renaissance with nothing else there. It's just a wonderful treat, even though, as I say, the picture is hardly one of our best. Another wonderful story and work of art is this uh, Perugino crucifixion. So you see it in its kind of uh, a frame that I'm not sure if it was made by Lord Duveen's studio or whomever made it, but the frame is actually making a mistake. 
And the mistake is this. The outside panels should be lowered by a few centimeters. So this should be down here, similarly on the other side. And if one sees it with the panels dropped, it's fantastically beautiful. And as a painter myself, I can't look at it because I know it's out of line. Um, but my, because it's got that frame, my colleagues won't reframe it, and I can't wait till they wake up and do it because it's going to look great. This is one of the pieces in the National Gallery's collections that used to be in the Hermitage. In the dark days of World War II, um, when uh, the Russians were really uh, hard up for materiel, um, Andrew Mellon, our founder, went to President Roosevelt and said, well, if the Russians want money, I know what I want to buy. And he had his art experts go through the Hermitage, and the Russians haven't forgotten a thing. Um, whether it's the uh, Alba Madonna or this, or um, this, which we will see next. So this is another one of the things that came out of the Hermitage. It is a, a St. George and the Dragon by Raphael. So <clears throat> um, it, it started out as a thank you note from the Duke of Urbino who had been given the Order of the Garter, the uh, knightly order um, from the, the Brits. And um, if you look, if I, and I'm really sorry, I got all these off the web, which is why the projections are so terrible. But there's a blue garter on uh, his leg right there. And uh, it then went to England uh, and wound up in the royal household and then it was deaccessioned by Cromwell and picked up by Catherine the Great. And then re, re, it went from the Hermitage to the National Gallery during the dark days of World War II. So my inference is that we are looking at a, an Italian painting in a Russian frame. And if you look at the, the corners, my suggestion is those are probably Romanov eagles. So it is a great statement of history and how power ebbs and flows and comes and goes from one part of the world to the other. So we see um, another way in which frames are preserving not only the physical quality of the artwork, but also the history that goes along with the artwork. Um, oh boy, uh, <laughs> this is a really fascinating painting. It is one of Giovanna Bellini's great, great works of art. It's the Feast of the Gods which is a very secular subject matter, which previously had a tabernacle frame. And tabernacles are essentially religious in their architectonic uh, elements. So it was felt that back when the, uh, the painting was cleaned, uh, that it should um, get another frame. And uh, one was ordered from London that is a, quite a beautiful copy of a Renaissance frame. But <clears throat> the, along the way, they really piece together exactly what happened, and it's a fascinating story. So if you look at an x-ray of this picture, this, the forest that we see on the right-hand side actually extended all the way across. And this not very bright artist named Dosso Dossi decided he didn't like it. So he painted over the upper uh, left portion of the painting. And he painted in this. Um, some of you may be able to see it, it's, it's lost to me, but somewhere up on the right hand side that's a really stupid looking pheasant up in the trees. Um, and Titian then realized that he had no way of taking Dasso's oil paint off of Bellini's, so he simply painted over Dasso. So we have a great early example of what I call additive conservation. And I say, yay Titian. Um, so the, you can see depicted up on the uh, upper left what Titian added and, and he certainly didn't diminish anything, um, cr all credit to him. So <clears throat> among the collections are some wonderful um, works that are, are books and manuscripts. Uh, this one is, uh, I, gosh, I, I've worked with it too much and I, I don't remember if it's a manuscript or an incunable. I, I don't know. But it's an example, since my role at the gallery was, was really trying to represent the interests of preservation, this is a, a sterling, excuse the pun because those are silver bosses on it, uh, <clears throat> example thereof. 
what, what you see is, and this is why I say our ancestors had a lot of good ideas. They um, put those things on the book to keep it from being abraded by anything. So we have some of the most longest surviving velvet uh, on the book still, um, thanks to the bosses protecting it. And we see and the Emperor Maximilian I there um, with uh, lapis lazuli around him in stunningly good shape because the foredge of the book, the outside, is covered with gold leaf, which is a vapor barrier. So again, we see lots of good ideas, and my, my idea is that we should always look carefully and respectfully at what we're gathering from uh, prior generations. Um, this comes also from uh, the Emperor Maximilian I. The, there are four volumes in the National Gallery by Georg Hufnagel, um, that are sort of natural history volumes. And this one is a person whose name really was Pedro Gonzalez, but it Latinized to Petrus Gonsalves, who um, <clears throat> was wound up in the household of Catherine Medici, who married him off to one of her servants. And the question always was, this is apparently the beginning of the Beauty and the Beast kind of uh, myth. Um, but apparently beauty uh, is not all that uh, distressed by the beast because she does have a, a cu customing, uh, comforting hand on his shoulder. Um, and they wound up having seven children, four of whom had the same facial uh, hair issue that he did, and we are never allowed to show them because the bright pink costumes are too uh, fugitive, but boy do I love to show that to visitors when I was in the storeroom because this one is just the most shockingly beautiful thing to see. Um, and again, it shows how well a book will preserve the most fugitive and wonderful stuff. I think this, these books are now going to be available in facsimile and online. And, and if you find them anywhere, um, and spend time with them because they're, they're called the Hoofnagel volumes and they're wonderful. <coughs> um, there is, a, I'm sorry that I don't have the frame here because there are some things where I could get the frame and others where I couldn't, but this is Titian again painting the Doge of, of Venice and it's in a Titian frame which I think may well be original. Um, it, the, the motifs and everything make it look, and portraits tend to keep their original frames. Does this one, if you're visiting Washington, you see this guy with his giant hand there, um, look carefully at the frame because I think it's a wonderful thing to see. Again, no frame here, it doesn't matter. The great story is who done it. So this is, <clears throat> there was a time, uh, some time ago, when there was something called the Rembrandt Project, where art historians from all over the world went to all the major museums and said, that is and that isn't. And we started out with probably 30 Rembrandts and wound up with maybe 20 to 20, 15 to 20. It was fine with us. And among all of that, there was this picture that was a huge conundrum because it is a brilliantly well-painted portrait of a little girl, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but it's clearly not a Rembrandt subject. He never painted pictures of little girls. And my brilliant colleague Arthur Wheelock has said it is possibly Carl Fabricius. Well, anyone who knows Fabricius, he was killed in the explosion of the Delft uh, magazine when he was a very young man. There are maybe 10 of his paintings really uh, in the world. So, hey, we don't need another Rembrandt, we'll take a Fabricius, thank you very much. Uh, there are times when, and the other thing I like to share with people when I was touring them with Washington is what ha when you have two examples of the same thing, what do they comprise? So uh, Jean-Antoine uh, Houdon made uh, fantastic marble portraits of people from the Enlightenment. Uh, and he, we had a wonderful exhibition of his and uh, back in the uh, days when we were invading Iraq. <laughs> Bad idea. And <clears throat> so a lot of people didn't like it because it was French and their, it ruffled their political feathers. But I got to meet George Washington, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and uh, um, Thomas Jefferson in meeting the, especially in Jefferson and Franklin, who actually sat for Udon. He is, his portraits are so lifelike that you felt you've actually married, met the sitter. Uh, so here we have uh, Voltaire in the uh, domestic, no uh, wig version, 
and if you, when you look at him and then see him, you're really feeling your eye thou with the great author and uh, <clears throat> a thinker. And then you get his formal portrait, and he kind of left the building. Um, so if, if you are in Washington, I would invite you to, there's, they're usually side by each in the, in the French galleries, to look at it and see if I'm wrong. So um, There are times when we would acquire paintings that had so much dark varnish on them that you almost didn't know what it was. And this was one. I remember when it arrived, it looked like a sheet of mahogany. And slowly, my colleague Michael Swicklick would say, I just found a snake. Oh, and there's some horses and eagles. These things slowly appeared. Um, but because the thing was in such a uh, visually compromised uh, condition initially, um, it was not a terribly expensive painting. So somehow we had to find a frame that didn't cost more than the painting. And that became my job. I was able to find someone in New York who could make us a nice federal frame of right size. And now if you visit, it's, it's wonderful because we don't have a lot of other great Wests. But Michael did such a great job that, that you will be able to see this in a, a good reproduction frame. This is a picture of similar uh, sort of background. This is the first painting that Albert Bierstadt did uh, when he returned to the United States from Dusseldorf. And it was meant as a kind of here I am painting uh, that uh, introduced him to America as a great uh, landscape artist. And then it went missing. And it was not found until we did an, a big Bierstadt exhibition. Someone in Rhode Island found this in a room of a, a all but abandoned uh, mansion. And we were able to buy it for a song at auction because no one else bid. Um, but this one is in its original frame. Uh, it, and and I'm, it's just a, a neoclassical frame of the period. But it's definitely in its original frame. Here we have not only the original frame, but this is the other one that's in Klaus Grimm. This is the frame that Whistler chose, and uh, he chose the gilding, and et cetera, and then he painted on top of it. So if you look along the right-hand side about at uh, uh, his mistress's shoulder height, you'll see a butterfly, which is his signature. Um, so here we have, not only do we have to worry about taking care of the frame, I mean the painting, but we also have to worry about taking care of the, of the um, <clears throat> The Frame, which is another work by Whistler. If you visit this, look up obliquely at her face, because you will see that he scraped it off and painted it over many times, and it's almost a hole in the canvas uh, where, where he finally got it to where he liked it. Um, one of the other wonderful things that um, you will see in Washington are sculptures by Edgar Degas. When he died, they broke into his studio, and there were about 140-odd maquettes. And these were all then cast, and the original casts are in the Norton Sarm in Los Angeles. And any other Degas sculptures you have seen have cast off the Norton Simon casts. But Paul Mellon bought all the maquettes and gave the majority to Washington. Some went to other places in England and, and the US and France. Um, but they represent a wonderful chance to look over the artist's shoulder, uh, almost as if he was just there with you. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that what he was using was completely happenstantial. And so he used plastiline and wax and uh, excelsior and all kinds of things, so that the temptation is to put one of these uh, maquettes, one of these soft, squishy waxes, as, as they like to call them generically, uh, next to the bronze. And the problem is when you do it, it causes corrosion in the bronze. So little black spicules suddenly appear out of the bronze. So there's a major issue with how these can relate to the later copies from which uh, th that came from them. Uh, another great effort of my wonderful colleague Steve Wilcox is the frame that we see on the masterpiece by Winslow Homer called Right and Left. This, when I first came to Washington and I saw it, I thought it looked really crowded. And it was, because they were using the frame that belongs on the lower um, Homer painting called Hound and Hunter um, on right and left, 
and if you look carefully, you'll see that the lower frame is a more elongated rectangle. So part of the sky in right and left was cut off. And what Steve did, because this is an original Homer frame on the lower right, Steve made a, a careful reproduction of it and put it on uh, left and right, and it looks wonderful as, as writ. This is one of the more interesting <laughs> stories about our collection. So we have a, one of our great founders was Chester Dale, and um, he had a self-portrait by Van Gogh, which it turns out wasn't a self-portrait. Um, and when, but no one was going to tell him that certainly, uh, when his, pa paint, uh, his portrait was being painted by Diego Rivera, Rivera was trying to get him to sit still. So he gave him a book, and it says, if you can see the title there, Chesterdale's French Paintings, and he happened to open it to the putative self-portrait by Van Gogh, uh, and he's sitting there smoking a cigarette, which is why all our Dale pictures had to have a lot of varnish, room, a lot of smoke removed from them. But <clears throat> um, the, uh, the wonderful thing is, when the Whitney family dispersed their collection, they gave us the real one. So here we have the fake Van Gogh and the real one, and I've seen them side by each on a table. Um, but when we had a, uh, an appreciation of Chester Dale, we had somehow in the label to recognize the fact that he was sitting looking at a fake, and it says a purported um, self-portrait rather than anything more uh, obvious. But uh, <clears throat> this is one of Chester Dale's great, great uh, gifts to the gallery. Uh, it's a painting called Blue Morning. Uh, and George Bellows is not as well known out of the U.S. as he is in America. But um, if you visit Washington, uh, you will see the best of the best of the best of Bellows. And Blue Morning was one of those pictures. And initially, they decided to take off all of Chester's cigarette smoke. And when they did, they found out that the elevated railway that we see at the top was actually folded over the top. When I saw this, it was in a, uh, a Louis frame and it looked like an Impressionist painting. It suddenly cleaned up and the, the elevation, elevated railway showed up, but what do we do now? Because the painting is bigger than the frame. So they went and looked carefully at another of our Dale pictures, which is uh, Fight Night, and they realized that that is an original Bellows frame. So we had someone copy this frame with this finish uh, that was on Blue Morning, and that's what you'll see when, when you go to visit in the gallery. There are some frames that um, some artists realize that the frame is so integral to the work that they actually paint their own frames. And this is a wonderful, um, there are not terribly many of these Cubist pictures by Marsden Hartley, but this one is a spectacular one where the frame is not only of the work, but it contributes to the work. So it's, it's, it has to, of course, be hung behind a, uh, in a box because you don't want anyone uh, touching the frame and, and causing problems with it. One of the last things, the last exhibition I worked on when I was in Washington, and this kept me there beyond when I really meant to be, <clears throat> was a, an exhibition about this painting. So if, if you know uh, Andrew Wyeth, the picture that comes immediately to everyone's mind is a picture called Christina's World, which was done the year after this. This is uh, a picture done from the Olsen house in uh, Maine, and it is if you see it, you will immediately feel the wind blowing from the sea, because that's the title, the real title. Forget this, Christine, Christina's windows complete my description, because this is the bedroom that Christina Olson uh, lived in and slept with. So looking out through that window, that really is Christina's world that way. Um, this, this picture, when um, it was the first tempera painting that Wyeth finished, and um, when he sold it, he sold it with a proviso that it will come to the National Gallery after a certain amount of time. So it finally, the time period expired, and, and uh, some of my colleagues who, whose uncle owned it wound up giving it to us. So we had a lo wonderful exhibition uh, in honor of Mr. Wyeth and, and his, and, and, and fortunately this does have an original Wyeth frame on it, so we 
were able to use that in the exhibition because one thing that, that I credit the gallery for is trying to find out what frames artists themselves preferred and then reproducing them for every exhibition, a monographic exhibition of that particular artist. And I <clears throat> hoped to do, have the time to make a Wikipedia entry on artists' frames while I was there and life intervened. But it's still an idea, I think, worth, worth thinking about. So here we see uh, the esteemed uh, uh, ri uh, uh, Richard Ford in front and Steve Wilcox in back, our frame conservators working in the frame lab in the, the West Building. Um, I have no idea what they're doing, but um, I think they're mostly just posing. But they're, they, the, the um, now I'm going to move toward the, the, what I was saying, the second part, which is how the contextualization, not just visually, but physically uh, of the art, really matters in very, very much so in terms of uh, maintaining things for the future. So this uh, picture done by uh, Robert Rauschenberg called China Summer Hall is 100 feet long. It's over 30 meters. Um, and it started out behind where the camera is and went down a commensurate about what you see on the wall there, turned a, a soft right angle, and then went for 70 feet and then got another, and then winds up on another roll. So this is not what you want to do um, while you're not wide awake, um, because installation of this was, was massively difficult. The other thing that um, shows what happens in museums is that particular uh, fiddle of a vial, I don't know, whatever it is, is actually sitting in a bucket of glycerin, which is fake water. But it meant that people had to go out every so often and take the lint off the glycerin, because then the illusion was lost if you saw how that it was actually a relatively solid material and not uh, water itself. One thing that is very important in muse museological terms is the ability to create uh, replicas or facsimiles. And um, this piece is one of uh, Rauschenberg's most important. It represents the period when he was working with Merce Cunningham and John Cage, and it has this, this beautiful uh, polychromy silk banner in the middle, or curtain, through which Merce's dancers would come. And it was in private hands and on loan to the gallery, and we were going to put it on view, and the silk was dying. It was exploding. So my colleague Julia Burke was assigned with making some kind of a support, and I was supposed to make a physical support, and I said, Ugh! This is going to look like a tavern sign. And so I woke up in the middle of the night and said, oh, Julia's wonderful. She'll make a great facsimile. And so everyone said, oh, well, let's call Rauschenberg. And he said, why not? The one that's there is already the second version. So if you see this, you're actually looking at number three. But of course, I had to take number two and preserve that when the thing left the gallery and went on into private hands. So, because that's, I, I would say, the, the gallery's commitment to preservation is really stellar. Uh, the, the first action word in the gallery's mission statement, there are four of them, the first one is preservation. And I, being a preservation fanatic, loved throwing that in my colleagues' faces. So this work, and again, it's terrible to see it in this context, but it, it represents a commissioned work by the light artist Leo Villarreal. And if you're moving, as we would be here, uh, from the East Building toward the West Building through what we call the Concourse, uh, this formerly dark and ominous space was made brilliant and, and illuminated by the Villa Real. So what we see here is the artwork is actually framing the audience. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, sort of end to that part of the talk. So looking at how, and I'm, I'm big, some of you have already suffered through these before, so I'm not going to labor over these, but here we see a Solander box, um, the 18th century design that Daniel Solander made up to store his botanical collections that he may have gotten locally here. Uh, he was out uh, sailing around with Captain Cook 
And um, the, the, my, my particular beef is we still make them as they did in the 18th century. I do think we should be able to improve on this somehow. Um, we, we have lots of techniques, and we were working on one earlier today, for uh, housing things without any adhesive, and this is, uh, that's not a real Georgia O'Keeffe, it's a facsimile in a paper, um, stretch paper support. We have also pioneered the use of desiccated blotter for uh, dehydrating things that really shouldn't be wet any longer than necessary, like hinges. Um, we have hinges that are, are go all the way around uh, the perimeter of our work. Uh, in the, the, on the uh, left-hand side, we're looking at the top of a Mark Rothko on terrible construction paper, so it needs support everywhere. On the right-hand side, we're looking at Saul LeWitt, that is a huge gouache that is held down by its hinge because it came in curled and no one could figure out how to flatten it. So my colleagues realized that by putting a hinge that will wrap around the backing panel, that would do the work of the objects of the paper lab. We also make paper supports for irregular objects. This is a kind of cradle that can be fine-tuned to pick up the backside of any irregular piece. So the, 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 the support and, and sequestration methods we have, even though they come from paper, actually serve all of the disciplines, paintings, uh, et, and et cetera. This is a, a, a sink being held shut with lashings. Um, here is a pastel spacer for pastels on board. Another paintings fragment spacer for with using needle punch polyester, so it's soft and cushioning, but but gives a gentle uh, uh, support to the entire perimeter of the fragment. Why we really want I want glass on everything is that your visitors are constantly talking. If, I know that there are print rooms in some parts of the world where they give them a clean rag to put in their mouth if they're handling the art. I think it's a great idea. Or put on a surgical mask, because as we speak, we do expectorate. And um, that means if you're dealing with someone who wants something up without glazing in front of it, then my question is, how much spittle would you like on your art? Um, the, uh, my, I'm personally a fan of uh, metal boxes for storing things, and in this climate I think that it, it's a good, simple, safe, quick way to uh, in, in, ensure the relative humidity. Uh, we use lots of different kinds of ceiling foils. Every time you go to the local store to get any kind of treat, it's going to be in a bag like this, and very often it'll have an oxygen absorber in it. Uh, we were looking at one earlier today. We learn by doing things the wrong way once. So we had paintings that went out to uh, palaces in Europe, and they came back with the acrylic that we had made in front of them warped in and touching the painting. And in both cases, the painting abraded the acrylic, not the other way around. But we learned that acrylic will warp toward the, war the wet or warm side. And so now we have to factor this in any time we, we want to uh, enclose something and protect it from an, an inimical climate. So we, we do this, and we test it over and over again. We've done hundreds of these where you start dry and watch it equilibrate to the uh, museum normal. Probably. I would say my proudest thing I have gotten to do while I was at the National Gallery was to ensure that the visitors saw this spectacular uh, masterpiece by Hans Memling in its proper position. So this, if you see it flat up above, you can see that the background just looks slightly out of sorts. Memling painted it to be at a 27 degree angle. And the people who own this in Bruges required that we have an enclosure. And um, we used a, a, a special anti-reflective uh, uh, acrylic called Optium. But if you try to bend it with heat, it crizzles. It gets all frosty. And so, again, my brilliant colleague Steve Wilcox figured out that if he scored it on opposite sides with a saw, we, I could then bend it uh, to the requisite thing. And sure enough, we were able to do that package it to uh, Bruges, uh, heart's content, and people were able to see it in this. Uh, what I want to say is we think we invent things. The Renaissance probably invented most of it. Um, it's, it's just seeing this picture that is actually three-dimensional uh, in its proper configuration was, for me, a, 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 a moment of, of real joy. 
Um, we, when we make these enclosures, we're always testing them and, and designing different types. This is a, a relatively quick one. Another, um, the, the enclosures we make help things travel. Uh, this is a 22 foot long print by M.C. Escher called Metamorphosis 3 that traveled to three different places in this box and did just fine. We can also make housings for boxes. So this is a, a pouch in which a cylinder box can, can be stored and protected not only from climate but also from pests. Because I'm sure all of you in this room know that pests, especially in the tropics, are a major issue. Um, finally, or, or almost finally, I, I would say that we are trying to, to, to the best we can to use packaging or enclosure to help the helpless. And the helpless are plastics because these things will fall apart on their own and they were. This is a piece by Klaus Oldenburg called Soft Screw. It came in the color of a chocolate bar and now it's the color of cocoa powder because it was left in the air and the light and it oxidized. So what we've made is this very sophisticated phone booth with windows on either side in hopes that it will go back toward where it was down the road. But I've, I'm not watching it these days because I'm gone. This is a package that we developed for panel paintings so that they could actually travel um, with uh, proper climate and panel paintings are very, very RH sensitive. So that we found that by making these highly sealed packages, we could actually achieve the, the conditions we needed throughout the loan without having any problems. One of the things we may move toward eventually is what's called anoxia. That means getting all the oxygen away. The problem is there are organometallic colors like Prussian blue, which will turn white in the absence of oxygen. And the bottom color on the right hand was white when it came out of its package. And my colleague Judy Wall said, it's going to be blue again, and it is. It turned back. But you can't really have this as a uh, possible thing. And, and these are tests we're doing of, of different levels of oxygen and, and seeing how much fading does or doesn't happen. But um, I hope that, okay, <laughs> I see the M wound up on the lower line. I knew something would go wrong when I was making this up last night. This is my email address and my phone number. Please write it down because I love emails and I will answer the phone if I hear it, but my hearing is going to help. So um, I, I, am, I am look forward to hearing from everyone. Um, and I, 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 I retired from the, from the government to do the work I really love, which was the outreach I already did when I was in Washington. So I would like to share with you a simple thought, which is that art preserves humans being. And that's it. Thank you very much.